What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are covering the single greatest Kang story of all time, uh, the one that recently completed, which has basically retold the origin of Kang, which is called Only Myself Left to Conquer. The reason why I say it's a retelling or a reworking of his origin is because Kang's origin does exist in Marvel Comics. The problem is it's scattered all over the damn place. So you've got Marvel 2-in-1 comics, you've got some Marvel premiere comics, you've got some Journey into Mystery, you've got Fantastic Four, some Avengers stuff, but you have all kinds of comics that all just sort of feed into this great big huge origin of Kang. What this does is it consolidates all the stuff that Marvel wants to keep, it changes the things they don't, and tells us how Kang the Conqueror became Kang the Conqueror. Here's the problem. This story relies on you understanding <laughs> Ramatut and Immortus and Iron Lad and all that stuff. So, um, we have to explain that before we get into this. Now, we do have a full-on explanation about Kang, but even then, people said it was still a bit confusing. So, we're going to replace Kang with you, and you are going to imagine you are Kang, and and we're gonna explain it that way. And if this can't solve it, I don't know what can. So here's the thing. <laughs> imagine you right now living your life watching this video and imagine that you suddenly discover the ability to travel back in time, right? And you can do anything you want to. Well, I mean, you're, you're like, hey, I'm gonna go back in time and conquer everything. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back to the days of ancient Egypt. I'm gonna change my name and I'm gonna conquer all of existence. So you go all the way back to the days of ancient Egypt and you start calling yourself Ramatut. And because of your technology, technological advancement, you're literally taking technology as it exists right now back then. Let me tell you something, you show up there with an ink pen, you're gonna blow the minds of the people in ancient Egypt, right? They're just, they're, they're gonna freak, they're gonna think you're God, right? Like they're, they're not gonna know how to process that information, let alone if you took back something like a computer, which we couldn't use, or a notepad or something along those lines, right? Just technology that they hadn't even considered yet. So you go back in time, you change your name to Ramatut, you rule that for, for a particular period of time. Now, somebody here in the present day, doesn't matter who it is, realizes what you're doing, they go back in time and they basically chase you out out of ancient Egypt, right? They're like, you don't need to be here. Uh, you're a bad guy. In the confines of the comics, it's the Fantastic Four. Let's say whoever this person is, they basically fight you, they overpower you, and you're forced to flee, otherwise you're going to die. So your intention is to say, okay, fine. Look, I have the ability to time travel. I can go anywhere I want to. I mean, I'm not just gonna quit after being beat once, right? It's like the dating game, right? Try, try again. <laughs> and so you're like, okay, I'm gonna go back to 2022, and I'm gonna concoct a new plan on how to conquer the past. But along, along the way back, along your journey back here, suddenly you end up in limbo and you're just like, okay, what is this place, right? And you explore the whole area. You start looking around, you come across technology, different things like that. Now, while you're here in limbo, it allows you to look at the entire time stream, past, present, future, the distant future. So you can literally watch your life unfold from the realm of limbo. And what you do is you come to this realization, you're inevitably gonna become a villain. That's a problem. Not only are you gonna become a villain, now there's an infinite number of universes out there where you took different paths and did different things and caused different problems. And maybe you form a whole council of yourself, right? Like literally hundreds of you who all meet together occasionally and do some crazy stuff. And so what this does is it leads to to you as you exist in limbo saying okay i don't want to become my villainous self i don't want to become that villain version of me so i'm going to stay here and i'm going to do everything i can to work against myself here's the problem what you have here is a situation where you will inevitably have to end up going back and becoming that villainous version of yourself because you exist right it's a paradox that villainous version of yourself went back into the past and became ramatut which led you on your journey to where you are right now calling yourself immortus which means you know that's inevitably going to happen no matter what you do that's the future that's guaranteed for you so what you're doing is trying to work to keep that from happening now let's move away from that version of yourself right you're just kind of out there doing your thing now let's say that this future version of yourself in the 31st century as you're there you come to this realization people are going to work against me and it's entirely possible that even even me even even i myself may not become this version of myself that's entirely possible i may not i may lose the ability to time travel or may never gain the ability to time travel maybe i decide to go to burger king instead of mcdonald's and that shifts up everything right so now i don't have the ability to time travel any number of things could happen that could that could prevent that so what i need to do is i need to go into the past and i need to meet with with my younger self and I need to make sure that my younger self does all the things that they're supposed to do so that I can exist. And so you do that. You go back and you meet with your younger self and you basically tell your younger self, look, I'm the guy you're gonna become. And so here's what you gotta do, right? You gotta, you gotta do this thing. You gotta do all these different things over the course of time. And if you don't, you're never gonna become me. Well, your younger self looks at you and says, well, I don't wanna be you. 
Like, I have no desire to become you, right? You're a dick. Like, I don't wanna be you at all. So I'm gonna do everything I possibly can not to become you. And so as a result, you've made an enemy out of your younger self. Now, for our explanation here with Cain the Conqueror, when you went back in time and became a ruler of Egypt, that's Ramatut. That's Cain the Conqueror becoming Ramatut. When you ended up going to limbo and started calling yourself Immortus, that was Cain the Conqueror. And in the future, when you go into the past and meet with your younger self to try to get your younger self to ensure they become you, that's Iron Lad. That's how all those things work together. Having said that, I don't know how, how else to explain it besides that. If that can't explain Cain the Conqueror for you, nothing can. <laughs> Either that or I'm just that bad at it. Having said all that, spent the last six minutes explaining that, let's get into the comic. The reason why you guys are here, if I have haven't lost half of you already. So here's the thing. What this does is it initially picks up with Nathaniel Richards in the 31st century. And what he says here is he says life at this point in time really just kind of sucks. It's very, very drab and very, very boring. He says by the time he'd reached the age of 18, he had conquered nothing. That his world was a utopia of pleasure and entertainment. That his so-called betters called it post-scarcity. He called it boring. A utopia to be sure, where 10 year olds could master advanced robotics, where a boy could have his throat cut by by bullies and recover in a matter of months, which is actually what happened to him. But it was also a place where time seemed to stop, that it was the end of history, a meaningless procession of tepid moments, a countdown to nothing. That while this utopia is beneficial for society as a whole in the sense that nobody wants for anything, there is truth to the statement. Conflict is in one way what gives people purpose, but is also what drives them to become better. That if people reach a point where there is no conflict, where there's no struggling or or no suffering or no pain, nobody will have a reason to improve themselves because everybody will have everything that they want. And in the face of that, what you would likely run into is a situation of stagnation. Now, whether that would happen in the real world or not, I have no idea, but it's what happened to Silver Surfer's planet. It's what happened to the people of Zen Law. They stopped focusing on religion, started focusing on science. They explored everything there was to explore in the universe. They cured every illness that could possibly plague their people. They understood everything perfectly. And suddenly there was no more reason to live because they had it all figured out. They had the answer to everything. The purpose behind life simply ceased to exist. And so what you end up getting is basically Nathaniel who goes on this kind of personal quest where he literally just starts traveling to these old places that had long since been forgotten and in a lot of ways were kind of off limits to the average person. But what he longed for was adventure. What he longed for was the this kind of bygone age, you know, an, an era that he was nostalgic for despite the fact that he never lived in it. He was kind of looking to this time when there were straight up heroes and there were straight up villains, all that kind of stuff. Fantastic Four, Doctor Doom, the Avengers, whoever in the hell else they happen to be fighting, all kinds of things. And so what he ends up doing in going to this museum, he actually ends up stumbling across a Doom bot. And that's kind of the crazy thing is because remember, Doctor Doom by this point is long since dead. And it's kind of a crazy thing because one of the big questions people have when it comes to Nathaniel Richards is who is he related to? Because Marvel's played it both ways. They've said that Nathaniel Richards is descended from Victor Von Doom, but they've also said Nathaniel Daniel Richards is, is descended from Reed Richards. Well, maybe not necessarily said that, but it's kind of been sort of alluded to over the years. And so that's kind of a funny thing because contextually, we kind of get an answer here that when this Doom bot activates, because it's just one of the creations of Victor Von Doom designed to stand the test of time, when it activates and starts attacking him, that of course this leads to King the Conqueror showing up, King as we know him, showing up here, destroying the Doom bot. And then of course the kid saying like, who in the world are you, right? Like you need to answer me. I am descended from, and then of course the whole thing gets cut off. Now that's where contextually we could argue that he is descended from Victor Von Doom. The problem here is that if he was, it's very likely the Doombot would have obeyed him when he told the Doombot to stop. So again, it's one of those things where we kind of get an answer and we kind of don't. Marvel's never really solidified it. And to be honest with you guys, I don't think they ever will. I don't think Marvel will ever give us a definitive answer as to whether or not Kang is the, the, you know, progeny or the descendant of Reed or Victor. I don't think we'll ever get an answer, but it's kind of a cool thing there is because ultimately where the two of them have this kind of conversation, Kane the Conqueror approaches this from saying like, your voice is embarrassing, right? Like there is no easier place to lie than in the pages of a book. You'll learn to trust only firsthand sources. Though I suppose compared to the gruel that's been, that you've been raised on in this 
place, this would appear to be a feast. So let me ask you, would you rather read history or would you rather make history? And so the allure of this adventure, the allure of being able to actually go and live these adventures that he'd spent so much time reading about, that's what draws the interest of Nathaniel Richards. And so at the end, you know, of course, in this conversation, Nathaniel's like, are you kidding me? Right? Like, that's the only thing I want. This world is so thin. It's like there's absolutely nothing here. And I want everything. And so the response of Kang is, good, that means you're ready. So now ask your question again, but ask it with conviction. And the kid says, who are you? And this guy, you know, Kang responds and says, it's, I've been called a thousand things, right? 10,000 different names by all these different worlds that I've conquered and so on and so forth. Like I've been called a conqueror. I've been called the eternal, the God Pharaoh, Ramatut, the timekeeper, Immortus. But despite all of them, there's only one name that truly rings true. And that's Kang the Conqueror. And so he says, in the beginning, before all of it, I was you. And so it's an, an amazing conversation that happens here because he says, through this doorway is an infinite number of times and worlds, eras that sing my name and praise, planets that worship me. But to earn those, I have known loss, defeat, and frustration. He says, I would save you that trauma and all of that time. Join me and own the mysteries of the cosmos. Join me and become king the conqueror and so in the end it doesn't take a whole lot to convince nathaniel the world he's in is so boring and it's so basic and it's so simple that in the end he's like absolutely right so he immediately joins him on this quest and what happens the first stop is king takes him to 65 million years before common era the age of the dinosaurs specifically one year before the asteroid hits that wipes out all the dinosaurs on earth and what king says is like this is your first lesson right? Time means nothing to Kang. Like, yes, I'm dropping you off here. And yes, you have a year to become you, but you think that way because you're thinking two dimensionally in a three dimensional world, right? Like it's, it's a, it's an, an interesting concept, right? Like people try to make it in the real world. How do I succeed, become successful and wealthy in the real world? I know by working for someone else. And that's not true. It's thinking two dimensionally in a three dimensional world. You have to think outside the box. What can you do on your own that can make you better absent the influence and the need of other individuals out there. Can you build a world for yourself or are you satisfied in living in someone else's? And so that's the cool thing here is because what Kang says, and this is one of the most important things that he says, it's easy to overlook. It's easy to not take seriously. But one of the things he says is he says, many of my memories are fogged by the ways of time, centuries of conflicting timelines playing tricks in my head. But I remember every one of those first days with clarity. My lessons began with survival, strengthening my body and mind where I could not strengthen it myself. Kang did so for me. Now, the reason why this matters, and this kind of goes back to our initial explanation of why it was so necessary involving Immortus and, and Ramatut and all those different guys is because whenever Kang went back in time and fashioned a life for himself, he became that person. He became that person that he was pretending to be. And so here's what I want you to do, right? In order to truly understand how this impacts Kang, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put in the comments or at least tell me, what did you have for dinner on January 26th, 2019? You can't tell me. And if you did tell me, I would probably just think you were lying, just making something up in order to, to, to be like, yep, I remember everything. No, 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 nobody remembers that. That singular moment there, right now, that's a couple years ago. And if I, if I changed that question and said, what'd you have for dinner on Monday last week? You'd be able to give me a much better guess. But instead of this being two years ago, let's pretend it's 10,000 years ago and a life that you lived for 90 years. That's what Kang contends with. That's the issue that he has. And that's why oftentimes in comics, you'll see Kang come across Immortus or or Iron Lad or something like that. And it'll almost be like they're completely different people because by all standards of measurement, they basically are, right? Like imagine you went back in time 50 years and lived out an entire life. And then at the end of that life, came back to the modern age and then just lived for another thousand years here. After a while, you wouldn't really even remember what that, what that lifetime was like when you went back 50 years ago, but it does exist. And that version of yourself is there. So it's just one of those, those weird and interesting things about Kang. It's why you do have different variations of himself, but they're also starkly different. In the end though, the cycle always continues, right? It's like Battlestar Galactica. All of this has happened before and all 
all of this will happen again. That Kang always becomes Kang, and Kang always goes and finds his younger self, and always leads his younger self to become Kang. The exception is Iron Lad, but at the end of the day, the argument still stands that Iron Lad will inevitably become Kang the Conqueror. So it's one of these things where he talks about, when, whenever he says, Kang showed me this, just imagine this cycle as it happens right now, except this young Nathaniel Richards grows up to be this adult Kang, and this adult Kang is basically reliving or retelling his experiences as you see them here. He's basically recalling the life that we're gonna see this young Nathaniel Richards live over the course of this comic. It's very metatextual, but that's why it's so loopy. That's why it goes in circles and cycles. And so that's why as, as young Nathaniel is talking about all this, he says, King showed me our life as a Pharaoh of Egypt and taught me its lesson. And he laid bare the rules of time, which lit my mind ablaze. He says his lessons were brutal, and he says I was proud when I overcame them, as I was proud of what we would build together. He taught me to shoot, he taught me to kill, he taught me that a plan, no matter how meticulous, only serves to make you weak. He forged me just as he promised, but as I was forged, so did I glimpse the flaws in the iron that made my teacher. Now, this is an important thing, because one of the things that you usually see when it comes to Kane the Conqueror is him showing up on the scene, doing some stuff, all kinds of hell unleashing, conflict unfolding, and that's basically it. You never really get to see the interpersonal side of Kang, the part of Kang that struggles. Because one of the things he says is he says that once Kang got so drunk that he could barely stand, and he took me to a far off world where he cried in the shadows as a woman died. He said one word, then was silent for days. That word being Ravana, right? Of course, Ravana Renslayer. Now the thing, the thing about this, the reason why it matters is because Ravana Renslayer was the love interest of Kang the conquer and she died right king's life literally fell apart when that happened and in fact the way that marvel wrote that it was almost kind of a question of will king ever recover from this it was focusing on that interpersonal side but you don't really see it all that often and of course even king made nathaniel swear he would never bring it up right like he, he would never mention it or anything along those lines and so what happens as he goes through this period right again back in the 65 million years that he's here as he goes through all of that of course he ends up facing off against you know some tyrannosaurus rex which is awesome blasts it with a, with a massive gun, <laughs> literally blows this thing's head off. And what he says, is, this, is, this is where things are really, really fascinating, and he says he would love to say that in the aftermath of killing this T-Rex that he feasted on dinosaur meat for days and he sharpened its teeth into knives, right? That he somehow honed his skills, became this brutal warrior that could live off the land. But he says that never happened. And the reason why is because by the time I killed this thing, all I saw was her. All I saw was this one person, right? This one singular individual. And like that, she had the complete and total attention of Kang. He never had a chance, right? Nathaniel was just smitten for this woman. And what was more interesting than this is that in the society that he came from, physical touch didn't happen. You never physically touched people. It was always done as a kind of synthesis, right? A kind of, uh, you know, barrier between you and somebody else as a way to like prevent disease, illness, different things like that. And so for the first real time in his life, he's experiencing tech tactile contact with another human being. More so than that, he's experiencing love. He's experiencing desire. He's having all these feelings that he's never quite really been through before. And so having this kind of experience with her, in a lot of ways, I wouldn't go as far as to say she's in love with him. And I would even go as far as to say he's not necessarily in love with her. If anything, it's more passing curiosity. Now, that will change. That will inevitably change. But of course, she kind of invites him to her tribe. And so of course, he ends up basically chasing her down, following her to that location, and he's taken before the people here. Now, what's kind of baffling is that from Nathaniel Rich's perspective, there shouldn't be any human beings here. Now, I use that based on the real world, right? That like uh, primitive human beings appeared maybe something around 300,000 years ago that the anatomical version of ourselves that exists now is probably about 200,000 years ago. And then over time, our minds just progress to where we are right now. Uh, in Marvel Comics, one thing to know is that when it comes to the evolution of the human race, we're not really given anything before the arrival of the Celestials. Like even in Marvel Comics, they don't do that. The closest that we ever really get got in terms of those early days is maybe a little bit of discussion about proto-mutants uh, with Gabriel Shepard. The old stories with, uh, not really old story, I guess they are now. Jesus, I'm old. 20-something year old stories, 21 year old stories by Grant Morrison <laughs> with new X-Men. <laughs> Jesus, I'm old. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> 
in any event, um, we're not really given an actual origin point for when modern man first appeared in Marvel Comics. So I can almost guarantee though, it wasn't 65 million years ago. <laughs> and this race, as is being told, right? This girl, Addie and, and her race, we're not really given any information. So we don't really know if like they're time displaced or anything like that. They certainly don't act like it. But Nathaniel is brought before the lasting piece, which is basically their elder, right? The, the leader of the tribe who kind of gives us this perception that he knows who Nathaniel Richards is going to become, but he doesn't know he's going to become Kang. If anything, it's more of his actions that demonstrate who he is as a person. The fact that he saved Addy's life from a dinosaur, the fact that he killed the dinosaur, basically shows that he is a person of conviction and strength. And as a result, he's brought into the tribe and honored as a warrior by basically being given face paint. Now, the other part of this is that the tribe, again, because they're primitive, relies on, you know, prophecies from the stars and different things like that. So they're very much given to superstition, right? This kind of a thing. And of course, according to the prophecies handed down from the elders, you know, presumably the ones that came before the lasting peace and by the lasting peace himself, they're doomed to be destroyed by a star, right? By like literally a meteor crashing into earth. They don't really know that's what it is, but that's basically what it is. And so the thing about this is that Nathaniel flees to Cain the Conqueror and says, we have the ability to manipulate time. You know, time does not matter to us. So let's just take them somewhere else. Let's take them to a future, right? We can just snatch them up while they're sleeping or whatever it is, but we can take them to, you know, some period when the earth is habitable again and then go from there. Now, this is one of the most important things that goes on with this new origin of Cain the Conqueror. Cain the Conqueror's concern is not a disruption of the time stream. The reality is that it would, right? Most likely the destruction of this race serves some purpose along the timeline, right? Their bones are discovered or something like that. Somebody makes some kind of a discovery which leads them down some path where they do some things and then that leads to them becoming a superhero and changes the entire course of stuff, who knows? But regardless, like you can't necessarily meddle with the time stream in that way. And so what happens here is that when Nathaniel runs to Kang and asks like, are you awake? The response of Kang is that no, it is you who's not awake, right? You're, you dream the naive dreams of heroes, the romance of Alexander, the purity of Steve Rogers. You will unlearn this sentimentality, never disappear from my sight again. You will do as you are ordered. You will learn the lessons I teach and never disregard guard them. And above all else, you will wipe that pathetic paint off of your face. And the response of, of Nathaniel is no, that's not going to happen. And so as an answer to this, Kang simply says, I do not make requests, right? You are here by my design and shall behave by my design. Your future lies in the balance. Heed me or be doomed to a life of failure of rot and toil and insignificance. And that's when Nathaniel's like, but that's the point. You're the one who's failed. You talk endlessly about conquest and glory, but you're just a drunk who makes me memorize his defeats. How doom tricked you at the fall of Manhattan. How the Fantastic Four laid you low in the sands of Egypt. And so this is kind of back and forth argument. And in the end, Nathaniel says, my life is my own. It's out there living on without me. And the people of that tribe, we can save them from the coming cataclysm. If time means nothing to us, then why can't I use it to save the first and last in this blasted world? And in the end, the response of Kang is, you believe that because you're in love. And it's that love that makes you weak. It's that love that takes away any measure of strength that you could have. That's the stance that Kang has. His sentimentality, the fact that he's experienced love and kindness and romance, he sees that as a weakness. He sees it as the thing that had always held him back. That if he could go back and time and he could alter that younger version of himself so that he didn't experience love that that sentimentality was stamped out of him then those weaknesses would never come to fruition in those moments when he hesitated instead of killing the fantastic four due to some sentimentality or some statement made by reed or susan or something like that right like who's going to take care of our children that if that sentimentality wasn't there he would have pulled the trigger without hesitation. That cruelty would have dominated. And so in order to try to demonstrate this, he drags Nathaniel to the camp. When Nathaniel says, I will save them, the response of King is, no boy, you did not. And opens fire on the place, just incinerates, kills everybody there. Every single person dies, right? They're completely and totally killed. And Nathaniel can do nothing more than just sit there and watch. Now, this is hugely important because what he says is, it was then that I understood, though I I had crossed the fabric of space and time. I had never left my cage at all. It was then that I saw the cage was Kang. And so what he did is he basically made this promise to himself that he wouldn't become Kang. He says 
and so for the final months of the Cretaceous, I pretended to study that which King instructed, while secretly I studied the lock, how the mention of Ravana might drive my jailer to drink, how a few herbs might intoxicate a glass of wine, how the armor that had opened the way might be mine to command. I'd rarely been as tempted as I was in that moment to take the inevitable into my own hands, but his words echoed in my ear. Time would conquer all my enemies. If only I could master it. And so literally, it almost appears on the surface, this is how Kang becomes Iron Lad, but that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. Instead, as this meteor comes crashing down into the world with the intention of destroying it and basically leading to the end of all things, he ultimately ends up walking away, travels through a time portal, and when he does, he finds himself in the realm of Rama Tut. And depending on who you talk to, who reads Marvel Comics, some will tell you that Rama Tut is far more extreme than Kang ever was. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section about this. Honestly, again, I think it's the best Kang the Conqueror story that I've ever read. And we still got four more parts. So we're gonna bring this to an end, guys, and I will catch you all later. Peace.